Hello, everybody. Uh, and thank you very, very much for coming out to see this event. Um, the reason we're here is because, as you may well know, the Wasteland celebrates its 100th birthday in October, on October the 15th this year. And we tend to think of 1922 as the year of modernism, the year that Ulysses came out, that Virginia Woolf's first mature novel, Jacob's Room, was published a fortnight after the Wasteland. But also, and not unrelatedly, it's a year that many people would claim marked a decisive shift in the history of Western civilization or feeling. And of course, things are a little messier than that. Uh, the historian Jan Morris said that 1916 was the year things changed. She said the first day of the Somme was the last day of the British Empire. And Virginia Woolf, as you may recall, said that human character changed at the end of 1910. But 1922 is a very good candidate. And so I feel that the, the birthday of the wasteland is more than just a number, because I think possibly we feel in the air around us now that something decisive is shifting, that an era is beginning and another era is coming to an end. And you wonder if the historians of the future may be arguing about whether 2016 or 2020 or 2022 or 2008 marked a decisive shift. So in a sense, it's, it's a proper birthday. It's a proper centenary. Um, the wasteland endures. Paul Muldoon said that the wasteland endured because it retained its glamour. And with, uh, and with Paul Muldoon, you probably are, are wise to look into his words. And glamour used to mean deceptiveness or spell casting or spell binding, as well as the modern sense of glamour. But I think that one of the reasons why it endures among, that you can say possibly it endures, is because it has no single dominant theme. It seems to be a poem about the aftermath of the First World War, and yet there's hardly a mention of the war in it. It seems to be possibly a, a project of poetic autobiography, and it also seems to fiercely resist the idea of poetic autobiography. But I think what you can say, possibly, and tentatively, is that one of its most insistent preoccupations is the silence, the lack of communication between men and women, and the violence enacted upon women by men. The whole poem is suffused with Dido, abandoned by Aeneas, or allusions to Ophelia, driven to madness and drowning by Hamlet, or Philomela from Ovid, who was raped by her father-in-law, King Tereus, and silenced by having her tongue cut out. And you will know, or you will meet, if you don't know, uh, Lil, a working-class Londoner, driven to destruction by the obligations of childbirth. And you'll meet the typist, a young typist who submits to a version of rape, which is all the more horrifying for not technically being rape. And in a less lurid register as well, the poem is absolutely lousy with couples that can't connect, with men and women failing to communicate. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. Gives you the shivers. Um, but that theme of the miscommunication between men and women, the paralysis in their relationships, goes all the way back with Eliot. It's there in his very first mature poem, A Portrait of a Lady, which we're going to hear first tonight to contextualize the wasteland. Uh, when I say his first poem, it's, it's sort of his first by a nose from the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. It's written when he was 21. Amazing precocity in 1910 and 11. And by the way, Prufrock is also a male-female duet in a quiet way, or a duet for one. The poem that begins, Let us go then, you and I, and goes absolutely nowhere, also features a second voice, a female speaker, who tells Prufrock, that's not what I meant at all. But Portrait of a Lady is a portrait of uh, a, a failed relationship between a cultivated older woman and a rather cocksure, self-assured and ironic younger man. And even then, at the start of Eliot's serious poetic career, the sympathy of the poem, I think you'll see, gradually moves from this ironic satirist of the male voice who narrates the poem towards the lady who somehow grows bigger than his satire 
at last. Sid. After that, we're going to hear Hysteria, which is a sort of David Lynchian poem set as prose about an unsettling moment of female hysteria. Hysteria, the feminine disorder, seen through the point of view of a male narrator who himself is utterly frozen and unable to help or act or, or intervene, who himself is suffering from hysterical paralysis. And there was a lot of male hysterical paralysis around in 1919, 1920. They didn't call it hysterical paralysis or hysteria, they called it shell shock. And that leads us to the wasteland, which we'll hear finally, the great poem of the post-war world, written by a man who was telling his friend in a letter, my mind seems unable to function at all. Written by a man whose marriage was rapidly becoming a disaster, as if in fulfillment of the intuitions he had had earlier when writing Portrait of a Lady and written by a man recovering during the recovery from a full-on nervous breakdown. And I think that one of the high on the list, let's say, of the many masterstrokes within the wasteland, perhaps the most brilliant masterstroke in the poem, is the use of the absolutely perfect poetic avatar for T.S. Eliot, or the Eliot that I've just been sort of glancing at. Um, Tiresias, the blind, hermaphrodite seer. The central character of the poem, in a way, its occasional narrator, is a man and a woman joined together, sharing the same body, blind but all-seeing and compassionate. Um, I think if you don't know The Wasteland, if you've never read it or haven't heard it, I, I hope it's going to be the start of a beautiful friendship. And if you do, then I think you'll understand why this uh, terrifying and beautiful and funny and glamorous poem is well worth celebrating. And I think we're pretty much the last event of the festival, so I cannot continue without saying thank you very, very much indeed to Viv and Hugo and everyone who, this is my first Boris, I can't believe how hard everyone has worked. Um, Absolutely. This is a wonderful festival. I feel 5% smarter than I did <laughs> three days ago. 5% humbler. <laughs> Listening to all these brilliant people. And speaking of brilliant people, Sinead Cusack and Jeremy Irons need no introduction. But allow me to note that they are both steeped in Eliot's voice, Eliot's music. Uh, I once heard Ms. Cusack uh, read... Rhapsody on a Windy Night, one of those readings which blows a poem wide open for you. The, you know, the people say revelatory. Well, it was revelatory. And Jeremy Irons has, has lived with Eliot's work for many years. And in fact, he was commissioned by the BBC to read pretty much all of it, um, which was broadcast on, uh, it took up the whole of a, a New Year's Day on Radio 4, 20, 2017. And those readings are collected together. Jeremy didn't ask me to say this, by the way are collected together on a CD, which, uh, which comes very, very, very highly recommended indeed by this satisfied Amazon customer. <laughs> um, so please welcome Sinead Cusack and Jeremy Irons. Portrait of a Lady. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you have the scene arrange itself, as it will seem to do, with... I have saved this afternoon for you. And four wax candles in the darkened room, four rings of light upon the ceiling overhead, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb, prepared for all the things to be said or left unsaid. We have been, let us say, 
to hear the latest pole transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips. So intimate, this Chopin, that I think his soul should be resurrected only among friends, some two or three who will not touch the bloom that is rubbed and questioned in the concert room. And so the conversation slips through velleities and carefully caught regrets, through attenuated tones of violins mingled with remote cornets, and begins... You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends, for indeed, I do not love it. You knew you are not blind, how keen you are, but to find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives those qualities upon which friendship lives, how much it means that I say this to you. Without those friendships, life, what cauchemar. Among the winding of the violins and the ariettes of cracked cornets, inside my brain a dull tom-tom begins, absurdly hammering a prelude of its own capricious monotone, that at least one definite false note. Oh, let us take the air in a tobacco trance, admire the monuments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks, then sit for half an hour and drink our box. Now the lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room and twists one in her fingers while she talks. Ah, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is. You, who hold it in your hands. Slowly twisting the lilac stalks. You let it flow from you, you let it flow. And youth is cruel and has no remorse and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course and go on drinking tea. Yet, with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace and find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all. The voice returns like an insistent out of tune of a broken violin on an August afternoon. I am always sure that you understand my feelings, always sure that you feel, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand. You are invulnerable. You have no Achilles heel. You will go on, and when you have prevailed, you can say, at this point, many a one has failed. But what have I? But what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? Only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends. I take my hat. How can I make a cowardly amends for what she has said to me? You will see me any morning in the park, reading the comics and the sporting page. Particularly, I remark an English countess goes upon the stage. A Greek was murdered at a Polish dance. Another bank defaulter has confessed. I keep my countenance. I remain self-possessed except when a street piano, mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song with the smell of hyacinths across the garden, recalling things that other people 
have desired. Are these ideas right or wrong? The October night comes down, returning as before, except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease. I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door and feel as if I'd mounted on my hands and knees. And so you are going abroad. And when do you return? Well, that's a useless question. You hardly know when you are coming back. You will find so much to learn. My smile falls heavily among the bric-a-brac. Perhaps you can write to me. My self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends, why we have not developed into friends. I feel like one who smiles and turning shall remark suddenly his expression in a glass. My self-possession gutters. We are really in the dark. For everybody said so. All our friends, they all were sure our feelings would relate so closely. I myself can hardly understand. We must leave it now to fate. You will write at any rate. Perhaps it is not too late. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends. And I must borrow every changing shape to find expression. Dance, dance, like a dancing bear. Cry like a parrot, chatter like an ape. Oh, let us take the air in a tobacco trance. Well, and what if she should die some afternoon? Afternoon grey and smoky, evening yellow and rose, should die and leave me sitting pen in hand with the smoke coming down above the housetops, doubtful for quite a while, not knowing what to feel or if I understand or whether wise or foolish, tardy or too soon, would she not have the advantage after all. This music is successful with a dying fall. Now that we talk of dying, and should I have the right to smile? And now a little vignette Hysteria. <laughs> As she laughed, I was aware of becoming involved in her laughter and being part of it, until her teeth were only accidental stars with a talent for squad drill. I was drawn in by short gasps inhaled at each momentary recovery, lost finally in the dark caverns of her throat bruised by the ripple of unseen muscles. An elderly waiter with trembling hands was hurriedly spreading a pink and white checked cloth over the rusty green iron table, saying, uh, if the lady and gentleman wish to take their tea in the garden, um, no, <coughs> if the lady and gentleman wish to take their tea in the garden, I decided that if the shaking of her breasts could be stopped, some of the fragments of the afternoon might be collected. <laughs> and I concentrated my attention with careful subtlety to this end. <laughs> the epigraph before the wasteland, or after the title, uh, is in Latin, but we don't need that. So in translation, it reads thus. For once I saw the Cumaean Sibyl with my own eyes hanging in a jar. And when the boys asked her, Sibyl, 
what do you want? She answered, I want to die. The Wasteland. One, the burial of the dead. April is the cruelest month breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life into dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Starnbergers, eh? With a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hof Garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russin, stamm aus Litauen, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains there, you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images, where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either. Your shadow at morning, striding behind you, and your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Frisch weit der Weind, der Heimat zu, mein Irish kind, wo weilest du? You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Yet when we came back late, from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet. I could not speak, and my eyes failed. I, I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing, looking into the heart of light, the silence. Ord und leer das mir. Madam Sosostris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold. Nevertheless, is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Here is your card. It's the drowned Phoenician sailor. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Look, and here is Belladonna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. And here, is the man with three staves, and here the wheel, and here is the one-eyed merchant. And this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man. Fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. Unreal city. Under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street, 
to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. There I saw one I knew and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at my lee, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep that dog far hence, that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. <laughs> you, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. Two, a game of chess. The chair she sat in, like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble, where the glass, held up by standards wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out, another hid his eyes behind his wing, doubled the flames of seven-branched candelabra, reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it. From satin cases poured in rich profusion. In vials of ivory and coloured glass unstoppered lurked her strange synthetic perfumes, unguent, powdered or liquid, troubled, confused and drowned the sense in odours. Stirred by the air that freshened from the window, these ascended in fattening the prolonged candle flames, flung their smoke into the lacqueria, stirring the pattern on the coffered ceiling. Huge sea wood fed with copper burned green and orange, framed by the coloured stone, in which sad light a carved dolphin swam. Above the antique mantel was displayed, as though a window gave upon the silver scene, the, char the change of Philomel by the barbarous king, so rudely forced. Yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice, and still she cried, and still the world pursues. Jug, jug. To dirty ears. And other withered stumps of time were told upon the walls, staring forms leaned out, leaning, hushing the room enclosed. Footsteps shuffled on the stair. Under the firelight, under the brush, her hair, spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak! What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you are thinking. Think! I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing again. Nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag, it's so elegant, so winter. What shall I do now? What shall I do? I, I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down so. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at ten, and if it rains, a closed car at four, and we shall play a game of chess. 
pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I don't mince my words, I said to her myself... Hurry up, please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back, make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil. Get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been away in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and gave me a straight look. Hurry up, please, it's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't, but if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. And her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already, nearly died a young George. The chemist said it'd be all right, but I've never been the same. Oh, you are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for? If you don't want children. Hurry up, please, it's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gammon, and they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it. Hurry hot. up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, come on, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta ta. Good night, good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Three, the fire sermon. The river's tent is broken. The last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed. And their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. By the waters of Lehman I sat down and wept. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud nor long. But at my back, in a cold blast, I hear the rattle of bones and chuckle spread from ear to ear. A rat crept softly through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house, musing upon the king my brother's wreck and on the king my father's death before him. White bodies naked on the low damp ground and bones cast in a little low dry garret rattled by the rat's foot only, year to year. And at my back from time to time I hear the sound of horns and motors which shall bring Sweeney to Mrs. Porter in the spring. Oh, a moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter and on her daughter. They washed their feet 
in soda water. Ces voix d'enfants chantant dans la coupole. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Jug, 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 jug. So rudely forced. Tell you. Unreal city. Under the brown fog of a winter noon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven, with a pocket full of currants, CIF London, documents at sight, asked me, in demotic French, to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi, throbbing, waiting, I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea, the typist, home at tea time, clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the windows, perilously spread, her drying combinations, touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled, at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. He, the young man carbuncular, arrives, a small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavours to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved, if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defence. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all enacted on this same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. This music crept by me upon the waters and along the strand, up Queen Victoria Street, Oh, city, city, I can sometimes hear, beside a public bar in Lower Thames Street, the pleasant whining of a mandolin and the clatter and a chatter from within where fishmen lounge at noon, where the walls of Magnus Martyr hold inexplicable splendour of Ionian white and gold. The river sweats, oil and tar, the barges drift with the turning tide. Red sails wide to leeward swing on the heavy spar. The barges wash drifting logs down Greenwich Reach past the Isle of Dogs. Where la la liar, 
Wa la 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 ya. Elizabeth and Lester, beating oars. The stern was formed a gilded shell, red and gold. The brisk swell rippled both shores. Southwest wind carried downstream the peal of bells, white towers. Wa la 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 ya. Wa la 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 ya la la. Trams and dusty trees, Highbury bore me, Richmond and Kew undid me. By Richmond, I raised my knees, supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Moorgate, and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate sand. I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands. My people, humble people who expect nothing. La, la. To Carthage then I came. Burning, burning, burning. Burning. Oh, Lord, thou pluckest me out. Oh, Lord, thou pluckest. Burning. Four, death by water. Phlebas, the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas who was once handsome and tall as you. Five, what the thunder said. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We, we who, who were living are, are now dying, dying with a little patience. Here is no water, but only rock. Rock and no water, and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock. Dead mountain mouth of carrier's teeth that cannot spit. Here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, 
and water, a spring, a pool among the rock. If there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and the dry grass singing, but sound of water over rock, where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, drop, drop. But there is no water. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead, up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether man or a woman. But who is that? on the other side of you. What is that sound high in the air, murmur of maternal lamentation? Who are those hooded hordes swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth, ringed by the flat horizon only? What is the city over the mountains, cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air, falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London? Unreal. A woman drew her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper music on those strings and bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall, and upside down in air were towers, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours, and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. In this decayed hole among the mountains, in the faint moonlight, the grass is singing over the tumbled graves about the chapel. There is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. It has no windows, and the door swings. Dry bones can harm no one. Only a cock stood on the roof tree. cock cock in a flash of lightning, then a damp gust bringing rain. Ganga was sunken, and the limp leaves waited for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. The jungle crouched, humped in silence. Then spoke the thunder. Ta, ta, ta. What have we given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender which an age of prudence can never retract. By this, and this only, we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider, or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Da, diatam! I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison, thinking of the key. Each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall, ethereal rumours revive for a moment a broken Coriolanus. Da, damnata! The boat responded gaily to the hand, expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited beating obedient to controlling hands. I sat upon the shore, fishing, with the arid plain behind me. 
Shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Poi sa cos'è nel forcio l'eglia fina. Quando fiam uti calidon. Oh, swallow, swallow. Le prince d'Aquitaine a la tour aboli. These fragments I have shored up against my ruins. Why then I'll fit you. Hieronimo's mad again. Data, Data. diadvam, damiata, shanti, shanti, shanti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.